and Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. Ron Davis is a professor at Stanford University. He is also something of a legend in the research into ME. It is my great honor to have him on the broadcast today. Ron, um, welcome to the broadcast. It's, it's great to be here. What is here. your full title? At I'm Stanford? a professor of biochemistry and genetics at Stanford University. Now you have a very personal relationship to ME, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. My son is very, very ill. And he's been ill for how long? Uh, well, he, he got uh, ill slowly, I think, from this disease. Uh, but it's probably about 10 years, but uh, about five years where he's been very severe. And this has caused you to take an interest in the disease and to direct your own? Well, when I realized that there really wasn't much in the way of treatment or cures for this disease, I felt I had to drop what else I was doing and turn my attentions to this. And he is essentially bedridden? He's His bedridden. His name is Whitney and he's 35 years old? Right, he's bedridden, he cannot talk, cannot swallow. We've uh, have to use tube fed, and uh, he gets IVs every day, uh, every uh, every day, for liquid. So he's in very, very serious yes, shape. Yes. Yes. Uh, are you hopeful? I, I am hopeful that you will find a cure, or that someone will find a cure. Yes, and, and uh, that uh, will be restored. And I'm just trying to contribute to that uh, by bringing uh, new data to the to the study. Uh, we post all of our data on a website before it's published. Give us the, the address of the website. Ooh, uh, I can't do that. We'll, we'll get it <laughs> and we'll put it on the screen. Yeah. Um, what is the thrust of your research? It's initially to collect uh, a, a massive amount of data, sort of the big data study, uh, because uh, from that you can generate hypotheses. And then that's why we put all that data up on our website so other people can look at it and generate their own hypotheses that can accelerate the work. In uh, other words, this brings in ideas. You, yeah, you need ideas. And NIH will not fund a, a grant that has a hypothesis. And you can't generate a hypothesis without observation. <laughs> so that it all has to be privately funded? Right now, it's, we have one NIH grant. Uh, I'd like to have more but everything else is privately funded. And uh, they have a reluctance to hypotheses? No, uh, I think the problem with NIH reviews is the fact that it, the, f the field is very young. They're not like they see in cancer grants or other very, very established uh, research fields where there's lots of tools and, and lots of background. Uh, this is new, so when they look at a proposal and you're developing something new, uh, they have some doubts whether it can be done or not. In medicine, as in many other things, sometimes it's just a better idea, isn't it? Yes. That's what the hypothesis, the search it, that's hypothesis right. is about. <coughs> I, I think of the, the, the development of the cocktail so important in age, yes. so important in treating childhood cancers, whereas at one time it was thought that this and, was a and, very and foolish and way to yeah, go. In fact, yeah. it was a very brilliant way to go. Yes, and uh, earlier on in the reviews, I think there were be in, uh, individuals on the review panel that thought this was not a real disease. It was all imaginary, and were very negative on any grant. Uh, I, I think that's largely subsided, but it's I'm sure not completely gone. So there is a prejudice against funding of this disease. I think uh, widespread. There is an a belief, or I've encountered a belief, that there's an economic interest in wanting it to be psychosomatic, particularly in Britain. With the well, certainly in Britain, service, that's right. And which had not wanted to spend the money either on research or on clinic, clinicians treating it as a disease. They would rather have spent the money <coughs> on psychologists and uh, uh, hoping that that would work. Well, uh, that's very inexpensive, except you have to look at the full cost of taking care of these patients. Um, they, many of them can't take care of themselves. So you have a person that has to quit their job uh, to take care of them, um, and also that takes those two people out of the workforce. And uh, it, it actually makes a very expensive disease if you don't treat it. It's much cheaper to figure out how to effectively treat it. What are we going to do about the dearth of physicians who know anything about this well, disease, we gotta, let alone treat it? We have to figure out a way to educate them. 
and uh, uh, Mary Dimmick has been putting together a team of people. She's here today in our house. Uh, she comes and spends time with us. Um, and that's done with uh, Lucinda Bateman at University. Uh, well, at, she has a clinic in, in Salt Lake City. And uh, this is to put together a program to educate doctors? Or yes. Uh, we have a, a structural problem in the way medicine is practiced, don't we? And that doctors tend to allocate very brief periods of time with patients that yes. doesn't deal with this yes. at all well with a disease like this, which requires Not at all. You have observation. To, right, because there's a lot of things wrong with the patients and you have to tease them out. They t the patients aren't necessarily experts at medicine um, and they're seeking help. For a long time it has been said that there is no biomarker, but in fact you do have a biomarker. We have, a, we have I think, a, a very good biomarker. Explain that, please. Um, <clears throat> the idea behind it was the fact that uh, the patients are fatigued and uh, they seem to have a difficult time uh, with energy production in some way or other. And uh, the, the idea was, okay, what happens if we take a cell from a patient, like a blood cell, the, the white cells? and we stress them, like you would stress a patient. This is kind of a crazy idea. Um, and we put in salt, sodium chloride, and that is a, a, a chemical that the cells have to pump out because it's toxic to them. And that is, it requires energy to do that. So if, and then we, uh, we wanna see if there's a change in the cells. And one of the very sensitive ways to look at a change, any kind of a change in the cell, size, uh, other kinds of internal properties is the electrical impedance of the cell. Now there's a device you use to do this. Yes. It's called a nano pencil? A nano needle we call nano it. Nano needle. That's, pencil needle. That's, that's because it, uh, uh, it's very very tiny and it's fairly long and it goes out into the solution and it brings in two, uh, like your electrical circuit, it has two wires and uh, they're made out of gold and then they, we measure the electrical in, in impedance between them. And this, you feel, gives a very accurate uh, analysis? Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a single electrode. We have hundreds of them there. The device has uh, 2,500 electrodes per centimeter, uh, and we measure uh, 200 times a second. And this device was built at Stanford? We fabricated at Stanford, yes. And what is its future? Will it be widely deployed? Can it be afforded by hospitals, doctors, clinics? Well, the current version is not very uh, tr uh, exportable. Uh, uh, it, it can only measure one sample, and that's because of the limitations of the commercial electronics. So we have to build a, a new electronic box. Uh, the, the, the one you can buy uh, commercially is around $30,000. That's prohibitive. Uh, we are making a new handheld electronic. It's also very large, and, and that's because it has a lot of versatility. We don't need all that versatility. So we can make something as handheld, and uh, we can probably make that for about $200. And how big would the nano needle be the handheld would be? Well, there'd be a handheld box, and that box can do 100 samples at a time. And then we have to take a, a device that, like a micro titer plate, would be type of a, a device if you want to do multiple samples. If it's in a, a, a clinic setting where you're trying to get a measurement, you only need to do probably one. When do you think it would be ready for wide deployment? Well, we're trying to push this. It's, it's really a matter of money. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, we have to we have to hire some engineers to make the next phase. Um, uh, we have a grant in to NIH, and of course what happens is you put a grant in and you have to wait nine months. Uh, usually your first application is turned down for some reason, and you have to reapply. That's the slow step. Uh, once we have sufficient funds to do that, and we're going out and trying to raise private funds to help accelerate this. Well, just for the benefit of our viewers and listeners overseas, uh, NIH is the National Institutes of Health. Yes and the primary research arm of the government in medicine. Yes. Uh, what about the medicines that have been tried that some patients look to? Amplogen is top of the list, probably, and then there's Rituxan B. Yes. Uh, what about Amplogen? 
Have you worked with it? Do you feel uh, that We have not worked with it. Um, I, I would like to get a sample of it and try it out even in the nanoneedle device to see what happens or uh, uh, with a patient that is on Apigen. And Rituxan? Um, we have done some experiments with that. Uh, we haven't seen any effects of it in the nanoneedle. Um, we have done ceramine, uh, which we can't use on patients in the U.S., uh, but Obnavio, we worked with Obnavio, uh, trying to get Just approval. Just explain what these two uh, uh, <coughs> uh, ceramine is a, a drug that is used on sleeping sickness. And interestingly, uh, sleeping sickness has pretty much the same symptoms as MECFS. And That's what you get from the tsetse fly. In the Africa. tsetse fly, and it's an, in, an invasion, uh, and, and it's eventually lethal. So it, the, the MECFS is not sleeping sickness, although it could be something related. Uh, uh, and ceramine has an effect on the on, on various channels in in, in cells, uh, which Bob Navio believes will really help. Um, we've done another compound called uh, SS31, which helps to repair mitochondria. That has a big effect on the nano needle assay. So tell us who is Bob Navio. Bob Navio is. Uh, uh, works out of the University of California in San Diego. He's an expert in mitochondrial uh, genetics and biochemistry, uh, as an, also an expert in met metabolomics. I have heard that you do work with serum, which is depleted blood, if you will. Yes. Well, we, uh, when we do the uh, nanonil assay, it's, uh, it's the white cells in plasma, and we have found that if we take plasma from a, a patient and, and add it to white cells from a healthy patient, uh, we get the same signal. So there's something in the plasma that's causing uh, some of the problems. There are diseases which <coughs> appear to be in the neighborhood of ME. Uh, and y yes. Um, Lyme disease is one. Yes. Uh, Gulf War syndrome is another. That's right. Um, what is that relationship, and what have you learned about it? We haven't studied those, and uh, we would like to, like to, but right now our private donations of funding are from patients that want us to work on MECFS, and we don't feel it's appropriate for us to take the money and work on a different disease. Uh, we are trying to raise money uh, f from those disease organizations uh, then to include that in a study. That could be very useful but there might be a lot of similarities, and it might even be a handle. We can use whatever we've done with MECFS to, to lay some understanding to uh, these other diseases. There are those who say that ME is not a single disease, that it's rather like cancer. It's a, it has all these commonalities, but there are many cancers. They're all cancer, but they're very different. Uh, do you have that feeling? Well, I, f I feel that there are a lot of uh, genetic components uh, that can modulate the, the, the appearance of the disease. And uh, some of these uh, are, are relatively common. Um, and so, yeah, you would see uh, some differences. And uh, it, it, it might not be a good idea to try to tease out all of the different subtypes because what you might find, because every person has a different genetic makeup, and you would find the number of classes equal to the number of patients. That is not useful. <laughs> How many people in your lab working on M? We have about 10 people working on it, but I try to recruit more. Um, we now have a couple of uh, engineers, a chemical engineer and a, a mechanical engineer working on it in their own labs with their own people. Um, they're experts at some of the stuff in terms of making devices. Um, we also have, a, a, have Mark Davis that we work with. Uh, we have a joint grant together. Ooh, He's an Mark expert Davis. in immunology, and that's a big, uh, important part. And then we have Mike Snyder, who we collaborate with doing uh, uh, his multi-omic approaches. Um, I understand that you want to move beyond physicians getting together in conclaves or researchers and saying, this is what I've discovered. You want to move things forward. How, how do you see that? And, and what is the dynamic there? 
Well, the dynamic, I think, is that classically people have collected data, analyzed it, made some ideas about what it might mean, and then published it, and that's the end. And then they move on to the next kind of project. Uh, that is what the National Institutes of Health have also used as their yardstick of progress. You, how many publications do you have? But th there isn't a huge emphasis necessarily on solving the disease, because uh, that's hard. Uh, it's kind of like the publication means I'm done and I can move on. So I'd like to get people to... Uh, you mean this is the phenomena, let's look at the next phenomena. Yeah. And uh, but to try to say, no, the goal is to actually cure this disease. Figure out what it is and then try to cure it. And you believe you will see that in how many years? Well, we have no idea because we don't know exactly what it is. Uh, we have a, uh, a major theory that is very consistent with the data so far, uh, and that is something we call a metabolic trap. So one of the, op one of the aspects of this disease is the fact that when you get it, you don't get better. In most cases, you get better with diseases, except for some of the chronic ones. And then you have them for the rest of your life. So as though there's something happening that's not reversible. And this metabolic trap is something that is not reversible. Once you're in the trap, you can't get out. Now, we think we can get people out, but it's going to require a special drug treatment to do that. Um, this trap re requires a mutation, uh, and, uh, and, and the trap is in a, a, a gene product from IDO1, which makes canurinine. And canurinine is a major regulator uh, of the body, especially the immune system and the brain. So it fits a lot of the symptoms. Um, but there's another gene called IDO2, and we think that gene is what gets people out of the trap if you do get trapped. Problem is that uh, that gene has lots of mutations. So we've now sequenced uh, seven, over 70 uh, individuals. They all have a mutation in IDO2, uh, except one. And uh, we're now looking at whether that person uh, doesn't have a, a, a structural mutation in the coding region, but in fact is a, maybe a regulation mutant. Uh, so uh, th that's what's led us to this. Why did we have all these people with mutations in this gene? And you would have to develop, having established that, you would have to develop a drug to change that pattern. We'll have to change, if that's right, uh, and we have some circumstantial evidence that it's right, but we have to get very clear proof of that. Uh, Proof meaning that we can't rule it out. Everything is consistent. All, all the molecular data is consistent with it. Um, and the, probably the first pass we'll put it into culture. Uh, these are dendritic cells which are trapped to see if we can still see the trap in, the, in cell culture. And then that gives us a handle on can we get them out. Uh, our plan, however, is to put this whole pathway into baker's yeast. Several times in our conversation, you referred to NIH and uh, the difficulty of getting grants approved and uh, not getting enough money. And yet, when I talk to NIH, they say they don't get enough applications for grants. Well, one of the problems. There's prob a dichotomy there. Well, there is. Uh, and they say they don't get enough good applications. And I would argue, looking at the reviews that I get, they don't have good reviewers. Uh, the criticisms that they pose in our, all of our grants that I've looked at are actually technically wrong. So that means they're not good reviewers. Uh, my first two grants were to collect lots of data. And they said, well, that's not hypothesis driven. And I would argue that, well, no, because we don't know much at the molecular level. And you've got to make, you know, scientific method is observation and then hypothesis. And you can't jump the gun and ignore the, hy the observations. You have to make observations. Well, uh, both those grants were turned down. And then several years later, they decided to do this, what they call hypothesis generating research. <laughs> they just relabeled it, and that's what NIH is yeah, now I doing. They were, they were, well, they were uh, cautious about hypotheses, NIH. Well, th th they're doing this big study at NIH that doesn't really have a hypothesis. It's collecting data which is what I proposed to do, I don't know, five years ago. 
Um, let me just go back to this issue of hypotheses. Um, is NIH pro a hypothesis or negative to it? No, they want to have a hypothesis and they want publications. Publications, uh, the old bubble that's, of, Yeah, that's, uh, the, that's a measure of success. And uh, uh, it is one measure of success. But if, if this you... This is reviewed publications? Yes, correct. You can't just put it up on the internet and say it's published? No. And uh, are there more or fewer journals that publish results for this kind of research? I don't think there's necessarily a particular problem of getting a publication if you've completed a project. It's difficult to uh, publish uh, fragmentary information that would be very useful to the scientist, uh, which is why we have a server that puts up our data on the server that the researchers can look at. All of the sequencing data is there. Finally, Ron, are the researchers, yourself, the doctors, the clinicians, whoever is involved, are they talking to each other enough? Uh, are they sharing information or sharing hypotheses? Uh, not enough, and it's partly uh, speaking different languages. <laughs> and uh, that's something I'm trying to correct. Could you enlarge on that a little bit? Well, if I talk to a doctor, uh, they use an awful lot of medical terms that I don't understand. If I talk to them about some of the, uh, the biochemistry or genetics that's going on, they don't really understand that that well either. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of this is a metabolism. Um, I'm a biochemist, it's a lot about metabolism. Uh, a lot of the doctors have felt in their medical school that metabolism is old fashioned because it was started in the 1940s. So I don't need to know anything about metabolism. <laughs> Uh, which is totally incorrect. I notice a lot of the medical students don't attend our lectures in metabolism. Have you got any any sense as to why there should be such intolerance of physical activity in patients? Exercise intolerance? Uh, uh, I suspect it's going back to the mitochondria ability to produce enough ATP in some way or other, but that's just one of the side effects. It's probably not the central problem. And that's one of the problems in studying any of these diseases. You may look at symptoms, but they may be uh, very far downstream of what's going on. So you always want to go upstream to find out what is, in fact, you know, if you see an observation, what's causing that? And then you find that, you say, okay, what's causing that? Because what I, I don't think you can cure a disease unless you understand, except for accidental. <laughs> and that's a perfectly acceptable way. <laughs> but if you need to figure out what is the primary cause, which is why we've come up with this metabolic trap, because that would explain that it could be the primary cause. And then you can, if you can correct that, you've actually cured the disease. And that may be true for a lot of chronic diseases. Uh, that you really have to go and look at them. There's a problem. And uh, you can't just look at the symptoms. So you're going to be trying to get uh, a common language between doctors and uh, well, it's, uh, yes, but uh, we need the engineers too, and they speak and an, they speak another language, right? Uh, and then the computer scientists the do another language, right? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a problem, uh, and so we try to get people to try to use very more common words, not necessarily very precise, but gets across the point, um, and that, and that's in all the fields, so that people understand. And of course, it, the longer you work together, you begin to pick up the language. So I bring in an electrical engineer, and I have no idea uh, what the biology is and what the biological terms are. And we try to teach them some of those, but also be careful not to overwhelm them. And a lot of people wouldn't think that medicine involves engineering and electrical engineering yeah. at that. Yeah. Uh, the the nanoengineering, which uh, goes into the nano needle, mm -hmm. nano being very tiny, mm -hmm. uh, not observable by the human eye. Uh, has it been hard to find people working in nano engineering because it's a hot field for many other things? Uh, no, it's not, and that's because uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, as you call them, nano engineers, uh, want to look into the future. They want to get into the future, and not what is right now very hot. They want to get into the next thing.
and they see medicine and biology as th their, their skills applied to medicine and biology is the next thing, which I think is correct. This is fascinating. Thank you so much. Sure enough. Great pleasure to have nice you to on the broadcast. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank mm -hmm. you. You're very gracious. Thank you.